Ladies and gentlemen, hello and welcome back once again to the briefing room. My name is Eric Cavanaugh. I will be your host. The topic is five critical success factors for big data and traditional BI. One of the regular topics of discussion really is speed and how can you crunch massive amounts of data in short periods of time. Obviously, that's a really, really big issue these days when you consider the new volumes of data coming out both traditional data, transactional data, as well as so-called big data, things like machine-generated data, social media data, all of these tags, all these RFID tags, and this whole so-called Internet of Things. Well, just think about the amount of pressure that all of that data is putting onto traditional information architectures. It's a massive amount of pressure, and traditional means of dealing with that kind of data are just not working, and they're not going to work. Something must happen. And frankly, there's a lot of interesting stuff happening in the area of solving some of these huge bottlenecks that occur. You know, bottlenecks wind up causing a lot of the consternation that major corporations and especially data management professionals see. And a lot of times these bottlenecks will simply force disruption in the organization, in the workflow, in the data flow, and that tends to cause some serious problems for analysts who are trying to get things done, for operational people who are trying to get new data into their systems, for all kinds of reasons, these bottlenecks cause serious problems. So there have been companies around for many years that focus on that kind of thing, but now there seems to be a whole sort of mini niche that's coming out, and these tools take very different approaches, very creative approaches, for addressing these serious challenges of data movement, of data transformation, of data loading, anything to deal with large amounts of data. And the company we have today in the briefing room is one of the most interesting ones I've come across. And the company is Velocidata. So these guys have done some really fascinating stuff. Now you hear a lot about uh, the whole movement with Google and Yahoo and a lot of these other guys doing massive parallel processing. So now you can just use commodity hardware. You don't have to scale up anymore. You can scale out, and that's all fine and good. But there are some really amazing things that can be done with scaling up, even right down to the processing units themselves, to the processors. So if you look at that middle bullet point, Velocity Data combines steel programmable gate arrays, FPGAs, graphics processing units, otherwise known as GPUs, and CPUs to enable high-speed parallelism, very creative approach to solving what otherwise would be a downright intractable problem. So we've got Ron Indek and Chris O'Malley from Velocidata on the line. All right, I'm going to hand it over to Ron Indek now. Okay. Um, well, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you very much. Uh, Eric, really appreciate the introduction. And I want to introduce to you our CEO, Chris O'Malley, who's going to be taking the first couple of slides here. Well, thank you, and thank you to everybody for actually coming today. Appreciate the time, and uh, hopefully this will be a valuable, valuable session for you. We wrote a uh, white paper um, actually months and months ago that uh, was from the lessons learned that we saw with Fortune 1000 companies, <clears throat> both prospects and uh, <clears throat> and our customers, that we saw consistently as as overriding critical success factors for uh, big data projects. And in that, there's a consistent theme. Eric hit on it, this need for speed and data transformation. And I want to use those five factors as we go through the presentation to kind of use in a foundational way for the story to show why they're so important uh, for companies as they look to trying to mass this big data as a competitive advantage. We were recently at the uh, Gartner Symposium, uh, and Gartner made a big deal about the fact that the digital economy is on the rise and that Companies increasingly are competing in these business moments, these transient events where, you know, data is being leveraged in context to, uh, you know, win the opportunity to sell something to a customer, you know, gain an insight at the right time to get an advantage with uh, a business you're competing against, uh, to do operational efforts in a more robust way as it relates to customer service. But increasingly, the rate of, you know, using data towards the ends of engaging customers whether it be in banking, insurance, and retail, effectively all across all the verticals, this is becoming an uh, increasing focus for companies to basically become different and better in the marketplace. This fact, though, is problematic uh, because in order to do and achieve those kind of insights at, at wire speeds, 
it's very difficult given the volumes of data. Uh, the volumes are going up increasingly. Uh, some will say a, a factor of, of 100x a year. Uh, the velocities of data are becoming problematic because there's so many different data sources coming in, whether it be uh, from a batch perspective, a, a streaming perspective, or just bringing back a lot of data from uh, you know, times in the past. Those things are becoming extremely complex in terms of overall management towards this end of kind of wire rate analytics. And it's even gotten worse by the fact that um, Hadoop is increasingly being used as a, a data lake or a data store and bringing in RCAD data from years and years ago to be also used in this kind of a framework. So when you start adding all these things up, a couple of things start to happen. One is analysts, business you know, intelligence folks and executives are starting to see incredible use cases for monetizing this data. Um, far beyond anything that, uh, you know, IT has asked to support in the past. You know, we're seeing, you know, examples like Amazon and being able to make merchandising decisions at the click of a, you know, a mouse and that, you know, other companies like a Groupon, like an eBay having to compete against it. It's creating very complex scenarios where people are thinking about incredibly robust ways to start to leverage data. So you, you get this scenario of way, way too much data, um, way, way too much transformation for which conventional methods can, can solve, but also an opportunity to create great value for the business. And client, or companies are starting to look at how do they, in fact, handle these issues from a transformation perspective. You get confronted with a lot of you know, conventional tool sets that people think about in answering these transformation complexity. And when you start to think about the scale of data that I've just discussed, the different forms of it, the fact that customers are trying to take you know, ETL processes from hours to minutes or even minutes to seconds, and you start to look at these conventional tool sets that people have used, like ETL tools or the mainframe or even Hadoop, you're seeing that you know, from a certain perspectives like scalability, um, you know, complexity, that many of these tools are adequate for this kind of new order of data, um, but in the areas of cost and performance, all of them lack. And, when you really think about what's needed to transform this data in ways that allow you to do real-time analytics, cost and performance become keys. And one of the things that we, uh, as a you know, company in terms of our founding, saw the fact that data transformation of legacy tool sets needed to be increased in terms of their performance and their cost by factors of 10, hundreds, even a thousand. And that energized Ron Indec, who's actually the founder of the company, to actually invent the technology that I'll, I'll actually pass it over to him to now describe. So, Ron, you want to go ahead? Absolutely. Thank you, Chris. And again, thank you, Eric, and everyone for joining. As Eric, you pointed out, you know, the, the traditional uh, uh, data sets and the traditional computational uh, approaches are really being stressed, not only by the requests that are being made from them, but their volumes and as uh, uh, everybody knows from Gartner, you know, the three Vs, you have volumes that are doubling almost annually. You have the variety um, coming from new sources, as you pointed out, whether it's uh, social media or sensors or, um, you know, coming from all sorts of different places and the velocity. You have the data, large volumes of data that are arriving very quickly. And most importantly, to gain that competitive advantage, you want to be able to transform that data. You want to be able to access it, analyze it, and use it as uh, immediately as they arrive. Um, many times, if you look at the data in an hour or in a day, it's too late to really take effective use of that data. And so as we were looking at uh, many of the conventional processes, um, if you look on this solution palette, the second column to the right, we talk about the conventional processes. Typically, we're going to be moving records through or uh, data elements through these processes at rates of about 1,000 or several thousand per second. But if you look at the rate at which the data are arriving, the volumes at which you want to be processing the data, um, your orders of magnitude away from where you need to be. And as Chris pointed out, we looked at this starting 15 years ago. We started looking at these conventional approaches and what we might do to, to help achieve the kind of access to the solutions and the data sets and the uh, analytics tools that we knew were going to be coming. And we weren't going to get there with conventional approaches. The kind of processors that were available, the kind of massive parallelism that we were approaching, 
um, didn't get us to the factor of uh, uh, 100 or 1,000, bringing, as Chris pointed out, the kind of hour-long processing down into the second range or days-long processing into the minutes range, which is what's needed for most of the current uh, or desired capabilities today. So, again, if we look at that conventional column and we think about trying to get a factor of 100 or 1,000 improvement in performance there, um, we just can't get there using conventional processes, so what is it that we're going to be doing? And Eric, as you pointed out, we're leveraging massive parallelism inside of the system using FPGA's GPUs and CPUs together in concert as a system to be able to process the data, to be able to transform it, to improve the quality, and to start to do pre-analytics so that the data arrive at the targets already pre-processed so that those targets don't have to work as hard um, doing those underpinning uh, functions in order to get the solutions and the answers that the people are looking for. So Velocidata came to market as a purpose-built hardware accelerated solution for this ingesting and transforming and improving data quality. It's really a screen processing engine that's built for real-time offloading. And when we think about massive parallelism, oftentimes you'll think about racks and racks of equipment. But one of the things that we were able to do by recruiting the different kinds of compute resources that Eric pointed out on that first slide, we can bring this massive parallelism together with this factor of 100 and 1,000 improvement performance by uh, an appliance that's only seven inches high. It's a four U rack mounted appliance that fits into any data center, uh, consumes you know 700 watts, and can give you the kind of performance that's needed uh, for the kind of solutions that people are driving for today. So if we think about a business example, we have a retail customer that needed to reduce the time that they were spending on integrating in-store, online, and mobile data to provide the real-time offers and incentives to their customers. While conceptually fairly easy, uh, the only solution that they had available to them uh, was giving them results days later, uh, at best maybe hours later, and by that time the person has either left the store uh, or has gone off on vacation or changed what it is that they're doing, these things have a very short shelf life, and so they want to combine historical and fresh production data uh, in a way that can uh, give their analytics tools the best chance at providing the best solution for those customers. The kinds of things that they needed to do, if you look back at that solution palette on the slide here, the um, conversion, so data are coming in from a variety of disparate data sources, some real-time production data, some historical data coming from data marts and so on, and you need to regularize the data. You need to put the data in a common format, transforming them and also generating views into them through key generation and being able to process that data so that it can move to the next set of stages which incorporates improving data quality, um, being able to validate certain fields within that data as it's coming through, and even start to pre-aggregate pre the data so that, again, that data lands into uh, the analytics tool already pre-processed, already um, uh, available for analysis, so that now what used to take hours, you can now uh, finish up in seconds. So if you look at the uh, solution palette on the right column, you see the kind of performance that Velocidata has been able to give to their customers. It isn't thousands of records per second, but hundreds of thousands to millions of records per second. And being able to provide that kind of uh, cost performance to them is something that they can't get any other way. And as we know, um, we see that a particular project may have uh, a particular cost associated with it, 
and uh, amount of money put into it isn't going to be increasing over time. If anything, it's going to be decreasing. And so one of the things that we uh, also bring uh, is the ability to contain the cost through a fixed subscription model that's independent of the amount of data process. And in general, the use cases that uh, we apply include ETL, ELT, and other data integration, data quality offloads, mainframe offloading, line rate data mapping, and also being able to ingest data, so transform it, do data quality, and pre-aggregate data so that it can go into Hadoop clusters and Hadoop implementations that have already been uh, processed so that those data don't have to be reprocessed into the Hadoop system. So if we look at the next slide, we have a series of uh, use cases, applications that, you know, we talked about theoretically um, accessing the kind of capabilities, but here are some real use cases, um, examples of where this kind of processing has given our customers a competitive advantage that they just can't get any other way. So I'll go through a couple of these. A credit card company was seeing that their mainframe charges were just escalating through the roof as the data was growing as the processing requirements were growing, the mainframe charges were just uh, becoming uh, completely unworkable, untenable. So we helped to integrate real-time production data as well as the historical data from the IBM mainframe. And instead of processing the data either on the mainframe at great cost or moving it into the Hadoop um, where it may take time to process, we were moving data very sophisticated, large records um, at about 10 million records per sec uh, per minute into um, that uh, uh, Hadoop cluster, which again was something that they couldn't do any other way. So this data ingest, the data movement, uh, the data flow uh, was no longer a bottleneck. And as Eric pointed out, you know what we are trying to do through Velocidata is to remove those bottlenecks through the data operations so that uh, the uh, business units and the um, businesses can um, really achieve that competitive advantage that they need in order to succeed. The second example we have listed here, um, we had a financial um, customer that was working to get production data to the retailers um, in order to provide them with information uh, for their customers. One of the key issues that they faced, the challenges that they faced, was being able to process the data and deliver it to the customer, but not allowing any kind of uh, personally identifying information or PCI data um, go into their uh, um, analytics hands and so they were looking for a masking solution, but not just obfuscating the data, but doing so in such a way that the data didn't break the downstream analytics processes. So they were looking for what was called format-preserving masking, format-preserving encryption. Um, and the only solution that they had available to them was being able to process maybe thousands up to tens of thousands of fields per second. That was the best they could do in any solution that they had that they could get off the shelf or build internally. We came uh, into this and within a couple of hours we were able to demonstrate that we could go at over 5 million fields per second um, to be able to process this data so that it was now completely safe and secure uh, for the users mm -hmm. downstream and for good compliance as well as corporate governance. The third thing, and I'll just uh, stop with that, was a customer service uh, representative um, scenario at a health benefits provider. Their data were always behind um, the mark. They were spending hours, days, and sometimes even longer than that to bring in the fresh data so that when somebody called, the, the uh, information just wasn't available. And so they were not giving the service that they knew that they should and they knew that they wanted to provide. So 
We looked at a particular data integration process. At the time, it was going through um, a conventional data integration tool, and its 16-hour process then was moved over to the Velocidata appliance with its massive parallelism, and we completed that task in less than a minute. In 45 seconds, the entire data set was completely transformed, cleaned up, and processed, and ready for uh, delivery to the CSR application. So these are these are a couple of practical examples. We have more on the website, and we can review them. Um, if you're interested, uh, you know, give us a call. Um, but through this process, what we've learned is that a lot of the risks can be mitigated, leveraging the tremendous cost performance that uh, we've been able to put together through the appliance. Because, uh, as we mentioned, the, the cost of the um, uh, system uh, is not going to be going down um, in a conventional sense. The data are going to be going up, and the resources available are not going to be increasing. So again, with our uh, cost performance capability, we really have uh, been able to mitigate several large data projects effectively. So we're looking uh, forward to having a dialogue with you, seeing how we can take this transformative solution into your business. So with that, I thank you for your attention. Really appreciate it. So um, first of all, I have a reasonably good understanding of how the Velocidata appliance um, works, but there again, I've actually looked at it. Can, uh, can one of these appliances actually serve many ETL jobs at the same time? Can I have, you know, let's say I've got three or four different databases that I'm wanting to serve data to from three or four different sources. Can I run them all through the same appliance? Yes, Robin. Um, so thank you very much. This is Ron. Um, yes, uh, we can connect up to 255 different clients, different uh, workflows, data uh, streams through the appliance at any one time. And, you know, as far as accessing it, I think you're right. Uh, a good visual is accessing the uh, appliance as you would a data integration tool, um, you know, an ETL tool. Just graphically drag and drop the functionality. You're not, um, you know, to your earlier point about parallelism, maybe uh, great but difficult to access. Nobody is coding in parallel uh, thinking to our appliance. You're simply dragging and dropping functionality. Um, from that palette that we described in the same way you would for any data integration workflow. And yes, you can have many workflows uh, concurrently configured for the system. So does it kind of sit there like a hub? Let's imagine, you know, let's imagine that I have an environment in which I do have, you know, let's say at least tens of uh, data sources and possibly four or five um, destinations. It just sits there as a hub on the wire and you direct it all through. Is that how it works? Uh, fundamentally, yes. Uh, conceptually, architecturally, that's correct. The data can come in from a variety of different sources. Uh, they can land in a variety of different targets. Um, and we can sit in the middle uh, more than a hub, uh, really, we are doing that transformation data quality checks and, you know, other processing. Uh, so it's a smart hub, um, a total data hub, if you will, for the data as it's flowing through um, and operating at line rates. So that is correct. All right. Um, you, you mentioned various data cleansing functionality, and I kind of, I saw your, um, uh, your slide on that. And the, the first thing is that my data cleansing, in my opinion, there is people uh, in, in various ways have data cleansing rules. Um, uh, and there also there's a, an element of deduplication. I was just wondering if you covered those things. Yes. So the, the kinds of rules that we have, again, are, are very similar to what a data integration uh, tool would have. The fundamental uh, processes for that can be uh, the kinds of rules that can be described through regular expressions, and we can run scores of regular expressions through. Uh, we can do validation, field validation, and record validations. We can do bounds checking, data uh, type checking, and doing the kinds of things that uh, you know, you'd like to apply to any data flow, to any data set as it's coming through. Um, and you access that through 
as I mentioned, either a very simple uh, graphical user interface, uh, or if you look at just one level below that, everything is configured through an XML configuration uh, into the system, and that can easily be uh, hand edited if you know some people would rather do that than working with a GUI. But yeah, simply by uh, installing those uh, desired outcomes, the rules uh, um, can be in instantiated. Um, as you pointed out in the case of an FPGA, they just get instantiated into the silicon um, when you hit the go button, and then you're running at uh, hardware accelerated rates, at wire rates on that data as it's going through. Okay, I'm, I'm, the, my next question is one that I'm not 100% certain you're going to easily be able to answer because I know you're fairly new in the field in the sense that uh, you've been sorry, I'm not, not sure when you initially came to market, but um, I'm aware that you, you've uh, certainly my mind is telling me you've probably only been selling for about a year. But if you actually look, if, if you looked at um, a normal uh, data center, let's say, that had an awful lot of um, data flow going on um, in terms of ETL from uh, various sources into various data warehouses or operational data stores or wherever it was going. You know, um, if you increase the speed of the ETL activity by a factor of a thousand, there isn't any way, there isn't any technology I'm aware of that could possibly in, uh, increase the database speed by a factor of a thousand. That is, it's not even if, even if you could, in one way or another, just replace what was there with the equivalent functionality in terms of a data store. There's no way you're going to get a thousand. So the impact of actually putting something like this in is to create what I think of as an imbalance. Well, you can you could also call it an opportunity. But it's an imbalance. You, we have been used to, over years, ETL taking a certain amount of time. Often, you know, um, an inconvenient amount of time, but a certain amount of time. And now, all of a sudden, you're shrinking that down to nothing. So what's the impact that it actually has on a data center when, when you implement this? Sure. Um, so a couple of things. First of all, to you know, answer your first question, how long has we been uh, delivering this kind of functionality? You're right, this functionality has been uh, about a year, year and a half that we've been delivering, but the underpinning resources, the uh, appliance itself, uh, we've been delivering to the market for the past 10 years. We are the engines back behind several of the international exchanges and banks and, and other things around the world. So the technology is well vetted uh, and is well uh, represented around the world. As far as what are we doing and are there bottlenecks throughout the system that we don't address? So let's start with that last comment that ETL takes a certain amount of time to get the job done. Whatever it is, uh, it, it takes, say, one hour to get whatever you want done, whatever you want processed, finished. We now bring that to near zero. We bring that to seconds. So you may have had a 30-minute extraction. You may have a 15-minute load. And then you had a one-hour ETL uh, process in the middle. You still can have that 30-minute extraction and the 15-minute load, but you've now taken what was ostensibly a two-hour process or near two-hour process to under one hour. So you really are bringing um, the data to the source much faster than you could before. The second way that we help the workload or help the flow um, for that data as it's going through. Um, keep in mind that some of the, as you pointed out, um, you know, in that memory uh, cascade diagram, that by being able to put data into memory um, can be an effective win for your system, as opposed to pulling it off a disk, even SSD. You know, getting it into memory is a great way to go, or at least a, a uh, an architecture to consider. Getting the data into that and processed in the right form still requires you going through your conventional CPUs unless you have some kind of hardware acceleration. So if you can uh, move the data through a hardware accelerated appliance like the Velocity Data Appliance, you now get all of that data into memory and ready for analytics as fast as you can move the data in, the processing happens at the same rate. So there is no delay, there's no latency, as you pointed out, there's no lag time in driving that data from the source to now the target, which could be 
and in memory or in a dupe kind of implementation. So does that make sense how, how we can still provide yeah, tremendous it, benefit? Okay. It, it, it makes sense, but it, it kind of begs the question. It, 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 it's like you put this in place uh, and that piece of uh, the data flow gets extraordinarily fast. But when, when it, it, it's going at that speed, my inclination or my kind of gut feel would be, well, you probably don't want to ingest in the way that you ingested before. You probably, you probably might like to think of doing at least some of the um, work, especially if you're going into an analytical database, you know, a, a database whose raison d'etre is to perform analysis. But you, you would probably think in, uh, of processing in the, the data in a different way because you're, never, you're not used to receiving it at that speed. But being able to receive it at that speed, maybe in one way or another, you start to think of switching memory for disk in the sense of let's actually let the ingest just be a large piece of memory and we'll write it to a way to disk at our leisure, but now we'll be able to access the stuff in near real time and therefore be able to do near real time analytics whereas we couldn't before. So do you see what I'm saying in the, in the sense of that the, the old application, you know, a service at this speed is going to make the old application seem as though we could probably improve it in one way or another. And, and I mean, the question here is, is that what some of your customers have been doing? Uh, and yes, that's that's a great uh, a great point to call out. Um, in fact, yes, a lot of our customers start with let's take a batch job and make it go faster. You know that CSR example that we had taking 16 hours and 45 seconds. You know that's a big win for that process because now the data are available, and the customers almost without exception, our customers start to think yes, now I can start doing things in near real time. I don't have to think about batches, small batches, micro batches. I can go to near real time streaming processing. So that puts the demand on the analytics tool to be able to uh, address that kind um, of data activity. So that is, in fact, um, what we had always envisioned. Um, most of our customers today start out by using us to accelerate um, or shorten batch jobs. But in fact, we are taking the customer, um, you know, and effectively taking them into the real-time uh, world of stream processing. Eric, have you got any questions from the audience? Uh, we, yeah, we sure do. We got a bunch of good ones. So let me just dive right in here. One of the questions here is: Would Velocity Data share? Oh, could you guys share some use cases that fuse the appliances with specific business processes, like in a manufacturing chain? Is something other than the traditional analytics, or are you largely focused on helping with analytical needs? No, as a matter, <coughs> sorry, as a matter of fact, we are uh, helping both with CRM uh, and with some of the other supply chain, uh, uh, manufacturing supply chain applications, where again, the better use of data um, gives uh, um, performance to that industry um, and being able to manage that data, being able to process the data quickly, um, whether it's a, a large aerospace manufacturer or an electronics manufacturer, um, those are the kinds of customers that uh, we have. Uh, we definitely can address those needs as well. It isn't just the um, you know transactional oriented retail processing uh, of data. So okay, good. Here's wide. A, oh, go ahead. I'm okay. Sorry. No, I was just going to say wide, wide use cases. So uh, again, I, I really do encourage uh, those with questions to to contact us. You know, start on the web and contact us, and and we can work through. Okay, good. And uh, here's a good question: an attendee asks or mentions first ETL tools uh, can often load lookup data into memory for fast lookup. But my question is, how does Velocity Data handle? lookup data updates. Can you do that kind of thing dynamically, or how does that work? Yes. Yeah, so we, of course, um, uh, as you uh, and Robin you know, pointed out, that uh, we have conventional resources within our appliance, so we also can leverage uh, in-memory uh, activities, in-memory applications. Um, we can uh, and do, in fact, one of our uh, uh, solution palette elements is a large table lookup. Um, we can leverage that, and we can do real-time updates um, 
as long as those data can come in and we can process them, um, you know, we can access them for that workflow uh, as soon as they arrive. Okay, good. And here's a question that popped into my head. So, as you know, there are a number of tools that are out there. They've been all over the place for years and years. You know, Essential, of course, now part of IBM, Informatica, mm -hmm. you know, companies like Ab Initio. There are lots of smaller sort of niche ETL vendors. Of course, Talent is out there. So there are lots of these guys doing this kind of thing. And I, what I'm curious to know is how would your system essentially communicate with an integration platform like an Informatica? Could you just kind of walk through how you keep it up to date as to what you've changed and what you've transformed in order that you don't you know, have any sort of disconnect in a metadata layer or a process flow or something like that? So first of all, I'll point out that we are um, we play nicely with, we are partnered with <laughs> Infinitica, with IBM. No, I mean, we are. We're, I know, um, I don't believe you. We are great. a partner because they see us as somebody that is helping them. We're not uh, competing with them, but actually giving their customers uh, the needed resources for them to be able to uh, succeed in their workflows. So let's take an Informatica uh, application. And again, we're an Informatica partner. Through, I don't know how familiar the attendees are, but through a call out, through a custom transformation or through a workflow uh, designation, you can um, ensure that the Informatica workflow is aware of uh, and the metadata are preserved and the data governance is also watched as the data are flowing through uh, both systems so that it really is a seamless integration, and that's true for data stage, it's true for talent. Um, we're, we're agnostic to the particular tool, and we try to fit in as easily as possible. We don't want people to have to code um, or think about two different interfaces, but really try to just look at one uh, integrated holistic interface that will uh, access ours. Uh, the same way you don't think about accessing uh, a CPU or memory, typically, uh, in an Informatica workflow. So it's okay, taken care of under the, under the covers. Yeah, then that's great. I want to push uh, this slide, too. So one of the questions was around Hadoop and what kinds of transformations or calculations can you do? And, and I'm guessing what you're saying is just about anything, right? You can. I mean, there are some things you don't do, as you mentioned, but for most of the kinds of things that people are now using MapReduce for, you can you can assimilate that too, right? Yes. So first of all, let's take a look at the slide real quickly. This was a cartoon to really show that we can connect to a variety of different sources. The double-headed arrows show data can flow from one source to another or from, say, for example, the mainframe back into the mainframe and doing a true offload to the mainframe. For the right uh, upper corner in Hadoop, um, Think of it as, as Chris was pointing out, you know, Hadoop is a great data source. It's a modern data uh, lake, so the data can just drop in unprocessed, so in raw form. But we know a priori many um, uh, processes are going to require that data to be transformed, cleansed, and pre-processed, aggregated uh, in such a way that if you do that up front, together with storing the raw data or in, instead of, depending upon uh, the choice of the architecture you'd like to do, um, we can do that pre-processing. So now, when you ask Hadoop to do something, it, whether it's analytics or whether it's some other kind of MapReduce process, the data are typically ready for that kind of operation. Um, and you don't have to do the ELT in place and wait for that ELT process to finish up before you start on your uh, end game, end result, getting the uh, data out of the Hadoop system. So fundamentally, you know, again, instead of going through all the different uh, uh, items, um, just contact us. We can tell you what we do, what's on our roadmap, you know, what's of interest to you. If it's something that's on our roadmap and we can bring it up, um, you know, we could probably deliver it to the customer before uh, they even go into production. So. Okay, so Good. and do you guys have any um, very significant cloud to on-premise type situations where you are serving as key functionality, bringing some transformed data from the cloud to the on-premise, or ideally the other way around? 
yeah, we have a lot of customers who are very excited about the format preserving encryption masking that we have because that is something that opens up. So you stand at the gateway, the network gateway to the cloud, and we can be that security gateway so that the data leaving the facility and coming in um, can be masked in such a way that should there be some kind of breach up in the cloud, the sensitive data are already uh, completely masked, completely void of any useful information. So, yes, that's definitely a good use of our capabilities and, in fact, what a lot of people are starting to use us for, whether it's an Azure cloud or a Cloudera or on-premise, uh, you know, hybrid cloud or uh, public cloud, so private, public, and hybrid. I see. That that strikes me as being just an absolutely massive use case going forward because we're still in this era that you, know, you can kind of barely call a hybrid on-premise era, it seems to me, meaning that pretty much the data that companies are working with is either on-premise or it's in the cloud, in the cloud for backup, for example, but not, not production purposes. And you, don't, I mean, you do see some use cases around literally connecting those environments in some meaningful way in real time, but it seems to me that what you're doing is really opening the door to that much more robust embracing of the cloud by even very large organizations in financial services and healthcare and other spaces like that. And that's just a huge gateway. Am I, am I right about that? Yeah, that's a home run. That's exactly what we're doing. And we're working with not only the companies, the organizations, the enterprises, the Fortune 1000 companies themselves, but we're also working with the network providers and the gateways to providing the kind of pipe that they need, the elastic pipe that they need to be able to move the data and access the data, whether it's on-premise or off in the cloud. So it's a very uh, good characterization of how we are implemented at several different sites. Yeah, that's very that's very interesting stuff. Uh, so here's okay. another um, great question from one of the attendees, which reminds me I'm going to expand it a little bit. But can you talk about the nature of these different chips, the graphics chip, for example, versus um, you know the, the CPU versus the uh, is it FGPA? I'm always forgetting how that acronym goes. But can you talk yeah, about the FGPA? Uh -huh. Yeah, the Go nature ahead. you know the nature of those chips and why they cater to different kinds of of processing power. Certainly. So a CPU, let's start out with that, the central processing unit. Those are your Intels and AMDs. Could be a multi-core chip. Those are kind of okay at everything. That was what they were designed to do. Um, but we know in the 80s, as the, as the gamers pushed on the uh, painting of the screen with more and more pretty pictures and moving them faster, uh, we had to offload that functionality from the CPU and the GPU, the graphics processing unit, was born. Um, and as Robin pointed out, or maybe it was you, Eric, that said, um, you know, you can have thousands of engines. So not just a single core or, or 12 cores. You can have thousands of cores that are processing data. And they tend to be good at numerical data. So being able to process uh, floats and doubles um, and being able to process a lot of data um, with great precision. The FPGAs are... Um, if you will, almost lower level, but can, you, you can instantiate hundreds of thousands of processing cores, each one doing a specific task, very good at bit and byte manipulation. So if you're doing the kind of regular expression checking that we talked about and some of the other things, just awesome for that kind of application. And you push the go button, you instantiate those 100,000 cores, and you can move the data through with almost no latency, and tremendous, um, uh, you know, end game processing on the data as it's moving through. And just let me finish with what we have done at Velocidata is really the ability to look at it as a system, a holistic system that has these different compute resources, including memory subsystems, including disks, including the network infrastructure, and be able to move the data through past each one of the uh, compute resources appropriately so that the processing unit, the Velocity Data Appliance, does not become the bottleneck in that workflow as the data are going through it. Yeah, I've, I've now wrapped my head around what you guys are doing, and this is just really, 
really impressive. I'm glad we got you guys in the innovator month because that I, I can see why it's tremendously disruptive, and I can see why you've said on several occasions now in this call, you know, for people who have particular issues, you know, get in touch so you can walk through things. So could you explain how? Because you have all these different um, processes basically that you now have on a pallet that can be dragged and used um, for getting something done with some large amount of data. Uh, can you walk through the, the sort of process that you have uh, mentally and, and frankly within the code that you write to, to do some of these things for how you address some new problem? Like maybe it's a heavy duty operations issue like the ones that Tendi's asking about manufacturing. You know, what process do you guys go through to identify how to map the, the newest process you're going to create? That's actually a, a little bit difficult to explain um, <laughs> without a whiteboard, but let me let me just imagine. try quickly. And this is why we have, you know, 1,100 patent claims that have been allowed and 30 patents and, you know. Um, we, we, again, we, we look at everything as functional blocks and elements that we have different resources here, human resources, who know how to code and set the workloads such that as the data go through, they, they don't slow down. So a particular functionality, a, partic a particular solution for somebody typically involves them simply taking our palette and gluing it together the way you would a data stage or an informatic or a, uh, you know, a, uh, uh, um, you know, any kind of uh, Pentaho or um, data integration tool. If it's something that we don't have, for example, we do not have sort on it now, we will uh, in the first quarter of 2014, you're just going to drag and drop sort to the way you would everything else. We'll have the, um, uh, the descriptions back behind that. And what it took here was an understanding uh, of the academic literature, um, uh, a lot of this stuff actually came out of the university um, here that um, allowed us to implement some new algorithms into the hardware. But the point is we have it. It's now a block that you drag and drop. And an individual doesn't come to us and say, you know, how do I code to it? It's just that easy. It's just obvious, you know, how you, um, or heuristic, I should say, sorry. Um, it's, it's quite heuristic as to how to uh, code to that particular functional block. If it is something that we don't have that the customer needs, you know, that's something that will work with the customer, the requirements, uh, make sure that it is widely reusable, so we'll figure out how to abstract it away so that others can use it, and then it becomes yet another functional block in that palette that people can leverage at any point in time in any workflow through that system. Yeah, that's amazing. And one of the attendees is asking here, what about data mining um, specific algorithms? Is that something that you're, it doesn't seem like it's in the same category, but do you also do stuff like that? So I'll share with you a little bit of our history. Um, we actually came to market with uh, uh, a data mining appliance 10 years ago that was um, that and biocomputation were two of the first uh, uh, uses of the uh, system. The palette that we have available does not include data mining, but I absolutely encourage, um, as several of our patents do, and as I say, that was our first, uh, we call it a text miner and data miner. Um, these are the kinds of things <coughs> we'd love to talk with the customers about. And you know, see if there's an interest and we can uh, deliver the kind of hardware acceleration that we're seeing now in these functions, you know, going from hundreds of thousands of records to hundreds of thousands to millions of records per second, we can do the same thing with uh, uh, different kinds of data sets. So that, that individual certainly can, uh, uh, you know, contact us. Right, and uh, I'll throw one last question over to you. Uh, from an attendee, and I'm guessing the answer is absolutely yes. Uh, the, the question is, so do you also support high availability and disaster recovery use cases? I'm thinking, sure. Yes, of course. Uh, so that's, that's the silly answer. <clears throat> um, each one of our appliances, um, as Robin pointed out, everything is COTS. Um, the, everything in there is redundant. 
And should an entire system go down, we have a dynamic uh, failover capability. Uh, this is what we've been delivering to um, uh, the Wall Street market. And, um, you know, it seems to address uh, everybody's needs. Uh, DR is the same way. It's just a longer throw. Instead of um, going to another system within the rack, it goes uh, to another IP uh, at some remote location. So, yes, definitely. And then as far as, you know, how do we demonstrate this and show it? You know, typically we can get in within hours, even though it's an appliance, and I know that scares people. <laughs> but within hours... We can usually set up the system, rack it, power it, table it, network it, and get data flowing and showing the kind of performance that we have. As, as Robin said, and I really do appreciate that, I, I, you know, until you see it, you almost don't believe it. But once you see it and then it's in your data center, it's really easy to believe. And then you start to think about all the things that you can do with it. So, again, we encourage people to come and see us and, you know, we'll uh, we'll bring a system in and challenge you to try to find new <laughs> uses uh, beyond what we know about today. Well, that's so. fantastic. Well, this has been a fantastic uh, webcast, especially for our Innovators Month. Big thank you to all of our attendees today and to our friends at Velocity Data and our very own Dr. Robin Bloor. We have one more briefing room.